Now we want to mobilize energy if we can, because this is really critical if we're going to do a really good job intervening on lethargy. Um, so the first thing we want to do is confront the phrase, I can't. This is simple. Ask your client simply to say, when they say, oh, I can't, I can't exercise, or they say, um, I can't get anybody to help me. I won't. The whole intervention is say the words, I won't. And then go on with your sentence. I won't exercise. I won't ask anyone to help me. But I can't exercise because I have this sore foot. Um, well, just say, I won't exercise because I have a sore foot. Saying, I will not, I won't, is an act of power and control because it really uh, defeats helplessness. Helplessness is, oh, I can't do it. But power is saying, I won't. And that is almost by itself an antidepressant. It's not going to solve a whole depression, but it is one intervention that becomes important. Um, changing I have to into I choose to um, is another important one. When there is a legitimate perception of choice and you follow it, it increases your sense of control. I'll give you the example of a woman in her 50s who was um, downsized out of a job. And she had worked at the same company almost all of her adult life and had developed from a person who had very limited skill set to being the office manager. And she knew a lot about running an office, but she had never had any classes in computer, no certifications for computer. Um, and because the company that she worked for didn't do a very good job of job description formally, um, my client is, is released from her work. The company was beginning to struggle financially, no fault of my clients. And the next job my client gets is really not fulfilling her skill set at all, but she felt like she had to keep working because her spouse said, you have to work if we're going to meet our financial goals. And so she chose, I, I guess I have to. Um, but what we began to realize is that um, she really didn't like her new job, but she wasn't doing anything about it because she said, well, I have to work, I have to work. And, uh, and uh, I was talking to her in the middle of a work day. She used lunch hour to come see me. She said, oh, I have to go back to work. I said, no, you don't. And she was like, what? She said, no, I have to be back there at, at two. And I said, no, you don't. And I did it on purpose so that she was kind of like, what do you mean? I said, well, you're choosing to go back to work. She said, no, I have to. That's when they expect me. And you are choosing to fulfill their expectations. And now she began to get what I was getting at. We started to have this conversation that there are so many ways that feeling like you're choosing even a difficult path makes it easier to follow that path. And so instead of saying, I have to, say, I choose to. And that gives you, again, another layer at which you feel a sense of control. So a way of mobilizing also is to get people moving. And to do that, there has to be motivation. Motivation requires reward, finding the reward. So Netflix and YouTube watching your show or watching videos that are interesting to you really uh, can, for many people with depression, create just a big time suck. Because watching them feels rewarding because it piques your interest and so you're mentally a little bit more uh, alive, but without actually um, requiring energy output. And as a result, because you're really not getting anything done, you're not accomplishing anything, it tends to decrease self-esteem, to decrease self-esteem, especially if it interferes with completing other tasks. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> 
Okay, um, let me give an example. This is a young man who was uh, late 20s, approaching 30, um, wanted to get a real estate license. And he, he had some skills that were already uh, working in that direction. He had some connections in the field, <clears throat> but he wasn't getting the exam studying done. And he spent so much time watching YouTube and he was feeling really bad about himself because he's not getting the task done. So by spending a lot of time watching things on YouTube, he was feeling mentally engaged, but he was completely not accomplishing tasks. I don't think in this circumstance that watching YouTube was any longer a reward. Uh, but was rather uh, an avoidance of things that were harder to do. Um, so what I want to do with clients is find things that are genuinely rewarding, things that they're already giving themselves, um, <clears throat> even though they're depressed. So even though they're, you're depressed, what are you doing that with your time? I mean, other than when you're asleep, are you watching shows on TV or on your on your uh, laptop? Um, are you playing video games? Are you reading books? Um, what are you doing that feels rewarding to you? And um, are you like taking coffee breaks or um, I want them to start to develop the mental, the mental mindset. Reward follows action. And then I want to work on getting the train rolling. What I really mean by that is I kind of like this metaphor, which is if you imagine a really big, long freight train, sometimes there are two or three um, locomotives that are going to start to pull it. And think about slowly getting the wheels moving, putting in the effort, and it's hard to get going, but the more you do, the easier it is to get rolling and go faster and faster. And that's the, the metaphor. These things become really challenging, everyday tasks for a depressed person. Now, you may need mentoring and accountability both to make this work, especially if you're working with uh, young adults. But what I mean by that is ideas of, of where to start and how to get it done. And I want to help this person identify um, things that need doing after they've identified what's, what's rewarding to them. And usually this is a good model for things that have components, tasks that have components to them. Um, like, um, oh, I'm gonna give you a millennial example. Um, this is, uh, a young woman in her very first apartment. And um, she had never had to take care of her domestic environment before, but she also was really a depressed person. Um, she had, it was a struggle for her to really just complete each day with the appropriate hygiene and get herself to her office job, which she thought was boring and she hated it and she was, just would come home and um, she would rather um, do a little weed than do anything else. But she didn't like that self. So we found some things that were rewar rewarding to her, one of which was she really loved playing the guitar. And um, it was something she could motivate herself to do, even though she was depressed. And, and she wanted to live in an apartment that was not so awful. She wanted to be able to let a friend stop by or invite a friend over so that they could play guitar together or um, watch an episode of Game of Thrones together. But she couldn't envision cleaning up her whole apartment. And so we made a list, and this was me mentoring her, of all of the things that needed to be done if the apartment were going to be tidy. And that included not, quote, doing the dishes, but it included pick up dirty dishes from the bedroom, pick up dirty dishes from the living area, 
and of course carry them into the kitchen. It included pick up food related trash, pizza box, napkins, empty um, soda cans or bottles, and um, each each component. I mean, so getting the kitchen clean was a big one, but it had lots of steps like collect the dishes, um, scrape them, stack them in the dishwasher, and so forth. So we made a list like that. And then every time she completed a task, she could reward herself with playing the guitar for 15 or 30 minutes, depending on the size of the steps she took. So some of these steps were pretty small steps. Um, getting all the dirty dishes out of the um, bedroom was a pretty small step, but scraping and stacking all the dishes was a bigger step. It took more time. So that's where I helped her decide what the right size step was for what her energy level was to do it. Now, for some people, doing all the dishes all at one time, which was a task that would have probably taken her 30 minutes, that, that that would have been doable for that depressed person, but then not also have to vacuum, dust, wash the floor, clean the toilet, et cetera. So what we did was we tried to break these tasks down and, and uh, do them in a way that she could then say, this is how far I got. A lot of times I will ask the client in this age group um, to send me a text when they've completed a task so that there's a sense that somebody out there is going, woo woo, good for you, you got it done. So in this case, small steps, 15 minutes of guitar playing, bigger steps, 30 minutes of guitar playing, just as a way to reward herself. Now there could have been some other um, aspects to this of um, how big the steps had to be and what kind of reward she would get. I typically don't like using video games for this short reward because they often take much longer to get into. But you could also do um, 15 minutes of YouTube. That's pretty easy to figure out. <clears throat> um, so I think that the concept is relatively clear, starting the train rolling. But there's another component that I refer to as jump starts. Because sometimes there are tasks, it's one task, but it's like very amorphous. Um, like the thing that you've been piling up a stack of papers on your desk. And it's all one task, which is file it, but you're not going to get it done all at one time. Very common one for depressed clients is piling up of junk mail that they believe they have to sort through it and make sure they know what's there, but they don't get around it sometimes for weeks at a time and it really piles up. When there's a task of that nature, I want to ask them um, to time tasks, first of all, and see how big of a commitment they really are. Um, for example, one woman, um, was telling me that she would bring home groceries from the store and except for frozen food or refrigerated food, the groceries would sit on the kitchen table, making it impossible to use the table to eat a meal, but they would sit on the table just for a really long, many days. And I asked why that was the case. I mean, why do you have cans and boxes of things? And she said, well, it takes so long to put them away. Um, and the other thing that she said is I'm getting this pile of uh, uh, cereal boxes and jars that I have to rinse out that should go in the recycling, but they're all stacking up on the counter and it's taken space up. So I asked her commitment to time a task. How long does it take to fold up a cereal box and toss it in the recycling bin? And how long does it take to pick up one can of corn and put it on the cupboard shelf. I said, that's all I expect you to do. I just want you to do uh, those two tasks. And I just want you to tell me how long you think they're going to take. She said she thought it would probably take a minute to put the box into the recycling bin and um, oh, maybe half a minute to put one can into the cupboard. Well, what she found out is it literally took three seconds to go, here's a can, now it's in the cupboard. 
That took 12 seconds to fold up a cereal box and toss it into the recycling bin. When she saw how small the time commitment was, she became more willing every time she walked past the kitchen table to say, I've got three seconds, I can put something in the cupboard. And um, when she was in the kitchen, she thought, I'm just gonna use 12 seconds to get one of those cereal boxes in the recycling bin or, or 12 seconds, I think it was 15 seconds to uh, rinse out the milk jug, pour out the um, rinse water and put the plastic milk jug in the recycling. So all of these little things, if they realize it doesn't take that long, it can be a big help. But when it's something like picking up all the toys off the family room floor, filing all the papers, um, um, even a bigger task like cleaning the garage, these can always be done in increments. So I do it in one of two ways. I ask a client to, when they sit down to watch a program, that um, mostly these days people don't watch programs that have commercials, because in the olden days it was a commercial break, and it was a good idea to just get up and do something while the commercials play. But in this case, you can set a timer for 15 minutes of watching your show, and when the timer goes off, you simply pause the program and get up for three minutes and do whatever you can do in three minutes. But you have to kind of pick a topic, like um, I'm going to um, sort through, I'm going to tidy up, let's do this one. I'm going to um, tidy up the family room. And so that may mean for three minutes, I'm gonna go around and pick up socks and shoes and clothes. And when the timer goes off at three minutes, I sit back down, and go back to watching my show for 15 more minutes, and then I'm gonna get three more minutes in. And in the space of what would otherwise be a sort of one hour, of, well, these days a 48, 49, 50 minute program, um, if you pause it for 12 minutes, you've got an hour. Um, so in the space of an hour, you have spent 12 minutes tidying up, and it's amazing how much you can get done if you do it in that particular way. Um, another example would be to say, every day I come in from work for the first five minutes or the first 10 minutes, usually not a bigger commitment than that, I am going to go through junk mail for five minutes and just throw away things that are junk and, and put the other things in a pile. And that I'm going to do that every day that I come in after work until the junk mail is sorted out. Um, so we're getting uh, a jump start. And often when it's a task like that, I'm gonna put in five minutes or I'm gonna put in 10 minutes. Once somebody's already doing it, they may put in five more minutes. So I say, listen, you know what the idea here is? There's no penalty if you do more. Not for uh, program breaks, not for five minutes when you come in from work. Um, there's no penalty if you do more. It's just that there's no punishment if you only do the three or five minutes.